Hey everyone, and thanks for jumping back into the Cryptoverse. Today, we're going to continue our collaboration series. We know we don't like this to become an echo chamber, so it's always good to have guests on the channel. Today, we have Jason Pizzino. He has a YouTube channel where he posts uh, quite a bit of content, and he also has Twitter and Instagram. And before we get into this, I, I will say, hey, go ahead and go subscribe to him. Follow him on Twitter, follow him on Instagram. You'll find the links to all that down in the description below and in the pinned comment. Jason is going to talk to us today about his outlook in general. Uh, you know, I mean, for Bitcoin, maybe we'll talk about the altcoin market a little bit and also to sort of view things um, under the sort of the umbrella of everything going on on the, the macroeconomic landscape. So, Jason, it's, it's a pleasure to have you here. <laughs> Likewise, Ben. Thanks. Thanks for having me on the channel. Sure, no problem. I mean, the, the you know the first question really is you know what's your sort of outlook on Bitcoin right now, and 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 that can range from like you know your short term, medium term, long term. Uh, what are you thinking is is sort of like the the your base case for Bitcoin moving forward? The base case moving forward, long term, I think we'll probably see a low sometime later in 2022 and probably extend it out as late as probably first quarter 2023. We can get into some charts and stuff later, just some like, you know, broad ideas of, you know, what I'm looking at in terms of timing. Um, so that's what I'm looking at for the macro stuff. And I'm just waiting for that point. In terms of downside, I can't see much more than where we are now, sort of 17 and a half. Uh, you know, we, there are, we, we've seen the support levels at around 12 or 14K and, you know, it's not that far down. So in terms of like a trending range, maybe we'll see a, a, a price lower than 17 and a half. But in terms of like that range that we'll probably bounce around like we've done in the past, we're probably already in it. For a medium term, I mean, I'd, I'd love to see some sort of bounce. You know, what I love to see and what the market will do is obviously two different things, but we've been down for quite some time. We've had a lot of red to the the monthly chart as well as the weeklies. And so I think some sort of bounce over the weeks, that's my sort of medium term, probably towards the previous support levels, you know, you sort of, uh, it was 24, 28K short term, we're looking sort of hourly to daily, then, you know, we're sitting on our 50% support. So that's my, my GAN analysis. Um, that's at around 20K. So it's sitting on that support. If we break down, sure, we're going to go test that sort of 17, 18K. If we hold that, then I think we've got a chance of uh, retesting the high price, which was around that sort of 21,700. So at the moment, that short term is basically trend, trending sideways and we have to wait and see what happens from there. But they're my targets. Breakdown and then the breakout. Okay, fair enough. It, on, a, on a more yeah. medium term time frame. Uh, do you have, say, like, let's say over the next six to 12 months, because um, you mentioned, you know, you mentioned that you could see Bitcoin seeing some type of a bottom later this year or maybe even early next year. Um, and if it is, if if we haven't seen the bottom yet, you, you don't I mean, you think it would not be too much further down than 17 and a, and a half K um, is is, you know, do you do you see it having some type of v-shaped recovery out of of the low uh or or do you think we're in for kind of a a bit of a grind and a, and a long winter i think we're going to be in for a grind the v-shape i think is probably over now since we didn't bounce already uh you know we dropped to that 17 and a half and we didn't see the bounce then you could probably wipe the v-shape off if we're looking for a v-shape we've got to see something like the COVID crash in 2020 where we just shot straight down and then um bounce from that point. So I think like a, a textbook V-shape, probably no go, but we might see smaller V-shapes if we do get that next capitulation. If we get a capitulation to 14K, then we get that sort of bounce out to 17 or 20. But I think, I, I, I do think we're probably going to grind around at some of the lows. I think we've still got more time to go for the market to get boring. I think both of us will start seeing even the views drop a little bit further and more subscribers mm -hmm. drop. Um, I think that stage is still to come. Uh, at the moment, we're sort of grinding around. People are still interested. There's, is it going to make it to zero? Is it going to make it to 10K? You know, can we bounce to 25 or something? So there's still that little bit of interest, but I think we'll probably still have one more crushing of the hopes and the dreams in the market before we're able to, to rejuvenate and head back towards that springtime and summertime in the market in terms of a cycle, not necessarily like summertime in the US, but summertime in the cycle, you know? Right, yeah, sort of like the the spring thaw or something after yeah. after winter's over. 
Um, yes. What do you, I mean, we sort of, in, or we sort of start at the beginning, we'll, we'll talk about some of the macro stuff. I think one of the common questions right now, and, and this is something that I've, I've thought about too, and I've, I've kind of laid out my own strategy to try to, to try to deal with this, is ever since tw- 2009, when Bitcoin was really first introduced, and we, you know, we, um, I mean, that's when you can trace Bitcoin all the way back to, to early 2009. It, again, it was born out of the financial crisis uh, that started in 08. But, you know, the, the question is, is Bitcoin has never really experienced a, a, a recession like the one we're potentially already in or like the one we're potentially heading into. And, and, and additionally, Bitcoin has never been around during a period of such high inflation. And, and I mean, and to be, to be completely honest, neither of you or I, like we haven't even been around really during a, a period of high inflation. I mean, the last time we saw it really this high was in the 70s and maybe the, the very early 80s. And so, you know, I, I think the question is, is like, you know, if, if 17.5, since Bitcoin's already hit 17.5, right? It's already hit it. And mm. there still is no clear sign, it seems like the macro is looking any better. Do you think the macro is looking better? Or do you think that, you know, that we still have a long way to go for the macro to actually start looking better. And if the macro continues to look bad for the next 12 months or so, how do you think that's going to affect the the, the price of Bitcoin? So we're talking the macro economic outlook? Right, yeah. I mean, they just like the, with the Fed and... Um, I mean, you know, like they, they're, they're, fairly, they're fairly hawkish right now because they they're, you know, they're trying to tame inflation and... I mean, there's not only that. I mean, of course, there's other things going on in the world as well that are causing supply, you know, supply strain issues and, and whatnot. But I, I, I just we look back at history and we can see things when inflation was sky high. The S&P dropped 50 percent. Um, and mm-hmm. I think so far the S&P is down, I don't know, like 25 percent or so from the all time high. So, yeah, something around that. Yeah. That so, yep. I mean, I guess the question is, is like, you know, and there's no sure thing, right? There's no sure thing in markets. But really, the question is, is like. If the S and P is is going to continue to dump, or if the Nasdaq is going to continue to dump for the next say half year or something, you know, how does Bitcoin get out of that without you know without going much lower? I guess is kind of the question. All right, so I'm having a look at the the macro picture. You don't mind if I share a chart? Sure, yeah, you go ahead. Or something like that now. All right, let's have a. Uh, all right, I've got a couple of shares. So let's have a quick look at this. Nice and simple. Uh, it is this one here. All right. All right, so that's that's up. Yep. All right, so we have this set, uh, eighteen year cycle here. Property prices, you see that there. You see mid cycle dip, recovery phase, and all that sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, looking at where we are now, I don't think we're going to see the Nasdaq or the S and P fall another fifty odd percent from their their current prices. I think we're sort of getting there. We're probably grinding along some lows for this next sort of six months. And I think a lot of the worst of it is over. Sure, we could bounce up and then drop 30% from that point. That You know, you and I understand that when it comes to right, maths. If right. it moves up, we can still get another 30%. Uh, but in terms of this cycle, we are in this mid-cycle dip. Now, if no one's ever seen this before, it's called the 18.6-year cycle. It's based on over 220 years of history. So this is basically looking at in terms of a property cycle. So the land is where the majority of the money in the economy is. You and I both know that. You know, there's mm-hmm. trillions and trillions of dollars that are in the land and everything else is sort of built on top of that. So this is like the house of cards and this is the economic cycle, at least that something that, that I follow and I've seen over the course of the last 16 years work very, very well. And so the mid-cycle is something that we're in currently, that sort of 2020 dip that we had and we're sort of seeing another dip now. This is all within that, that period between the first recovery phase of the seven years and then the explosive phase. So that's what I'm seeing come next into the later part of the 2020s, so into that mid to late part 2020. So that's where we get this explosive phase and that's where everything starts to go um, crazy again. So we're sort of in this period now, so I'll stop, I'll stop sharing that and I might have one more there. Basically, looking at where we are, it's all sort of leading towards the plan and the cycle that we were expecting a correction. We've got that correction. Markets can't run up forever. That's, you know, that, that, that's pretty self-explanatory. We expect corrections. And so from this point, our levels, uh, let me just share another one. 
So I've got Bitcoin up there, but I'll just move it across the S&P. Um, you know, our levels are sitting at about 3,500 as the next support. And I think at the absolute worst case, which I don't think we're going to get to, but 2,700 for the points. I don't think we've got that far to go. But somewhere around here, and we're sort of nearly at those levels now, these 50% levels, again, this is sort of GAN analysis, just throwing a little bit of TA in there. And, and guys that haven't seen it before, I usually just say, look, it's, it's similar to if you're using a, a moving average. You know, you sort of look for these levels to come into play as act as support and resistance, and that's how it works. So we're just taking extreme levels in uh, parts of the cycle. So the, the NASDAQ, S&P, probably not far to go if we just use a measure from where we are to the lows. You know, it's another 8% or so. Obviously, if the market runs up and comes back down, it could be 20 or 30%. But somewhere within this zone, I would say, is probably where we're going to sit for the next six or so months and then start to climb our way back out of it. That leads into that next part where everything gets explosive again. And we haven't seen that for real estate yet. I know a lot of people think that it's uh, uh, real estate prices are crazy, no one can afford it, and people can't afford rents, but we really haven't seen the banks start to create any sort of um, credit yet. And so that is the next and the last stage of the cycle that generally happens over each course of these cycles that we've seen for 100 or so years. And the cycle itself is over 200 years. So we've seen some sort of money creation that continues to pump the market up, even if the Fed you know, stops printing money, they actually don't come back, we'll still have other ways. And we're seeing it now with cryptocurrency as well. You know, a lot of cryptos, these uh, you know, neobanks, these sort of tech startups with banking, it's like throw your crypto on here, use your crypto as collateral, then you can start to go and buy property, use that as a, as a deposit to buy property, and that stuff just keep, keeps pumping up the market. So where does that leave Bitcoin? You know, to go the full circle, just need a little bit of background on that whole cycle. I think Bitcoin has the uh, possibility of just continuing to trend where it is in this next six months, people are going to feel like it's absolutely the end of the world if we went from 20K to 17K again. Like, you you and I have seen that. It happens time and time again. If it drops to 16K, it's the end of the world for a lot of people. So I think the emotions can get really extreme, but the moves might not be as severe as what we've seen from the top. And so that's how I think it's going to play out sort of for that next, you know, six to 12 months until we find that low within this period and then try to grind our way back out. Sure. So let me, I, there's some stuff to unpack there. So, so the first thing is I'm not yeah. an expert on real estate and, and it's something I'm trying to, to learn more about. Um, I've, I mean, I've only, I've only recently started getting, getting more into, into studying real estate markets. And, and one of the reasons is because of just kind of how crazy it's gotten over the last couple of years. And a lot of home prices are up, you know, two X over, over a really short period of time. And even in one year, some housing markets are up 40% or something. So thinking about like the housing market, because I do imagine the housing market will affect other markets as well. It's just like what we saw in the financial crisis of 08. Um, we saw, you know, when the housing market collapsed, it brought down a lot of other stuff with it. Now, I don't really know that they think we're heading towards the same type of scenario as 08. That was a very specific type of scenario. But my question is, is with the housing market, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I, I think what you said is that we're sort of just in a sort of like in a mid cycle correction in terms of this 18.6 year cycle for real estate and that there still will be another leg up later on uh, in the 2020s, maybe the mid to late 2020s is, is sort of what you're thinking. Um, so maybe the next leg up will start within the next couple of years or so. Now, I guess my question on that is related to interest rates because you know, it's, it's very difficult, I, I think, for, for a lot of people, uh, at least for, for you know, ordinary consumers uh, to to buy a house right now. And one of the reasons is because the mortgage, you know, interest rates have gone up so much. I mean, it, it, it costs you so much more money now to afford a house uh, that's not even as expensive as it, as it might have been six months ago when interest rates were a lot lower. Do you think that the, the real estate market continuing higher, um, let's say the mid to end of this decade, will, do you think that'll be contingent on, on the Fed pivoting and, and you know, sending interest rates back lower? Or do you think it, it doesn't really matter? Because you, you could also argue that, like, you know, historic from a historic standpoint, interest rates are still somewhat low compared to where they were, say, like three or four decades ago, you know? So, so I guess yep. that's like the biggest counterpoint. So, so do you think that, that that final part of the real estate cycle is, is contingent on, on anything that the Fed does, or do you think it's going to happen regardless? 
the cycle will continue up regardless. It has happened for 200 years and it always finds a way to, to continue and to complete. And the reason why it continues and completes is because the value of the land is enclosed by the private owners. So until that ever breaks down, which, you know, powers but be or whatever you want to go through, they're not going to allow that to happen. You know, we haven't seen that. Any time a country tries to say, let's privatise the land and, uh, you know, use the funds of the land, the value of the gain to then go back to the citizens, it gets broken down. It, it, you know, war happens, that sort of thing. The structures need that to remain private. So I know that sort of sounds a little bit sort of a tinfoil hat. Let's leave that to the side. Don't worry about that. But in terms of the interest rates, yes, you're right. The um, low, low interest rates that we have seen and have seen for a very long time have the room to move up a little bit. Some people, will, and this is where the argument starts, they say it can't go more than a percent, it can't go more than 3%, it can't go more than 5%. And so I think that's where people get a little bit confused or you know, they have their own points of view and this is what has to happen, that's why the market has to crash now. And we're just, we're not seeing that. And I think you're right when it comes to how low the interest rates are, it's, it, there's still room to move and allow people to expand. They're not going to be able to buy in the same areas that they once wanted to buy in. And that's what happens every single cycle. You know, it's, it's nothing new that we haven't seen. You know, this happened in GFC, markets ran up, interest rates started to climb into the, the second leg, so we call this the second half of the cycle. Interest rates started to climb, that was okay. But it's not until the peak, which like we've seen, everyone agrees that the Fed always acts too late <laughs> they came in this time, started to raise rates, and they're doing it all too quick, all too fast, rather than just like a no, nice, slow, progressive thing. You know, that's, that's the Fed. It happens in, in Australia too. It's the same thing here. It's the same thing in pretty much every Western developed country. But towards the peak of the cycle, they again, everything is really, really inflated. They act too quick, too fast, and then that usually topples the market as well. We saw that in 2007, 2008. Our interest rates here, I remember paying when I had a couple of uh, properties here, Nearly 10%, that was my, my interest rate, you know, from the bank. And I think the cash rate, someone can correct me, I think it was like seven and a quarter or so mm. here in Australia. Maybe it was six, seven, something like that. And so it happens again. We saw it in the 80s as well. It starts to climb up. They act too slow. They raise it really quickly. And that's usually what topples the market over at the end. But right now, things are still relatively cheap. And just with some of those news headlines, maybe you've covered, seen it yourself as well, it doesn't have to be retail that just buys real estate there is obviously huge funds that are buying real estate. So it doesn't necessarily have to be that affordable for the everyday person. It just, there needs to be bias. It's just a supply and demand. And we see BlackRock and all those guys just buying up tons of, tons of areas. Yeah, I think I saw a chart the other day that showed that like, you know, institutions and like large businesses that own at least like 100 properties like the percentage of real estate that they own has just been going up for the last like couple of years or so. So, yeah, I mean, you know, perhaps you're completely right on that and that it's, you know, for, for the average consumer, it might, you, you might be getting priced out of houses. That doesn't mean it has to necessarily fall right away. It could just be painful for a while. Um, I, I mean, I know, I know at least the real estate market that I've experienced, it, it's, I mean, I, I think demand has gone down some slightly, but I think the main problem is that supply is still at, at, at extreme lows right now. And a lot of people don't want to sell their homes because if they were to go out and buy another home, their interest rate's going to be much higher. Um, so I don't know. I mean, it's And then just... you've got the commodity prices. You've got right. commodity prices increasing, so it's more expensive to, to, to purchase, to build, takes more time. Labor's really difficult to get at the moment. I'm pretty sure it'd be similar to you guys. I've seen a lot of the news with the US. It's labor shortages, I see it here all the time, <laughs> labor shortages, right. prices are going up on tradespeople here as well. So you sort of factor all that in and that's just part of the next stage of the cycle of the, the price increases and people not selling, supply shortages. So demand is still there, supply shortages, it just, it just continues on. Do you think that, let's suppose, let's suppose this plays out and, and you know, we see real estate kind of in a corrective phase, maybe for the next year or so, where it just kind of gets a little bit boring, maybe two years. I mean, I know you said the mid to late 2020s is where you expect 
um, sort of that final leg. Late 2026 is usually that peak. That's what we're looking at, about late 2026. Maybe it extends into 2027 or 2028, just just as a guide. But, you know, we've, we've been saying 2026. And uh, just for anyone listening, the 18.6 is the average. It can range between 17 to 23 years. And what's okay. happened over the last, I think it's 10 or 12 cycles, the average is about 18.6. So, sorry. So, so I mean, you're at, at the end of that, though, like, what comes after that, I guess, is the question. I mean, like, you know... I, <laughs> I mean, I, I, I get that it goes down, but I mean, how, how long does it typically go down for? Like, I mean, because that's, that's always the other thing. It's like, you know, sometimes with, with even with crypto, it, it's not always about how long it goes down because, I mean, you, you run a YouTube channel. I mean, crypto could drop 95 percent, but as long as it goes up 5 percent the next week, everyone's happy again. You know, as long as the bottom's in and we just start going up again. So how long does it normally take real estate to, to sort of bottom after, after some like major blow off top? So that chart that I had up just a second ago, it's about a 14 years up roughly. And from that peak area to the low, depending on the cycle, sometimes it's to the low, sometimes it's to that higher low where you've bottomed and just started to come out. It's approximately four years. Okay. So basically, yeah. if, if the peak is in, say, 2026 or 2027, you'd be looking for a bottom maybe early in the 2030s or something. Um, yeah, it could be sort of 2029 if we had a quick sharp correction and then it sort of plateaus out. Just like we saw, uh, I think it was the GFC period, the property started to plateau, um, peak at about 20, uh, 2006, late, uh, early 2007. And then when we sort of dropped, we had the you know subprime mortgage crises, 2008, a lot of crap happened. And then the market sort of bottomed around 2010. And then we got that little bit of a higher low into 2011, maybe early 2012. And so that's sort of where you go from that peak of 2006, 2007, and then it leads you into that bottom of about 2010 through to 2012. So you've kind of got that four-ish year window, and it's just going to depend on, you know, other factors that are coming in. You understand, like, you know, both both you and I understand that if you're playing with the macro game, you've got to have some sort of tolerance, as um, as they say, you know, what's a few years among friends, that sort right. of thing. Yeah. No, I mean for yeah. sure. I I just. Um... It's interesting because again, I'm not I'm not very you know well in tune with the real, with the real estate market, um, mainly mainly because especially over the last say like you know five to ten years, I I just found it so much easier to like just put money in crypto and stocks you know because you don't have to like maintain the properties or anything so I just I wasn't as uh, as interested in in it as as I'm starting to get a little bit more interested in in that side of in that side of things. And I know a lot of people that like I mean absolutely swear by the real estate market and they've made a fortune in the real estate market. So I mean perhaps that you know that four year downturn, uh, assuming it comes uh, at whatever point. I mean because there is some tolerance on it, right? I mean that's probably an mm -hmm. opportunity for the next generation of of um, real estate investors to maybe really get involved in the real estate market. Um, but, you know, what do you think, I mean, I mean kind of like circling back, back to sort of like, you know, cryptocurrency, um, <clears throat> you know, I, I think that one thing that, that investors are experiencing right now are, are, is really the downside to a lot of, a lot of altcoins. And I mean, you know, Bitcoin, I mean, Bitcoin's down 75%. I mean, when it went to 70, when it went to 17.5K, it was like down 74, 75%. Sure. But we've seen altcoins already drop. 80%, 85%. And I mean, some of them have just gone asymptotically to zero already, you know? So, you know, what's your view on the altcoin market? Because there's always a difference between, you know, Bitcoin being close to a bottom and altcoins being close to a bottom. Because, you know, in 2018, I, I distinctly remember this phase. And again, you don't, I mean, you don't have to see the same thing play out every cycle. So I'm not, I'm not trying to say that we have to see it. But I still remember in 2018, there was this phase where Bitcoin just sort of went sideways at 6K for like three or four months. And altcoins were just dropping like a rock during that time, even though Bitcoin was constant, you know. So do you think that altcoins are going to be stronger this bear market? Um, do you think that the dominance is of Bitcoin is is going to go higher? Or, or do you think that, um, you know, do you really think that like altcoins, like there, there's enough real utility or maybe there's enough enough coins locked up or whatever it might be that'll keep those alt, alt valuations propped up. I mean, again, if you look at any altcoin chart, most of them are in downtrends against Bitcoin. But I guess the question is, is where does that downtrend end? Do you think we're getting close to the alt Bitcoin bottom or do you think that's still a ways off? 
I think we're still a ways off. I, I focus okay. a lot on the alt BTC charts. I, I know you're similar. And then I also focus on the alt ETH charts. Mm. And then if there's any other competitor to these two majors, I'll start focusing on that too. And the other one that's really held up strong is like BNB. If you're looking in the top 10, right. probably BNB that's held up reasonably strong against Bitcoin. It also, did in, it also did in 2018 as well. That's true. Yeah, you know the whole exchange thing. They're actually making money. Right. Um, so if, you know if we had our time again, and in hindsight, it would have been better just to load up on BNB and just walk away. Right. That's, or like, or that's, uh, that, that's the thing. Or just load up on USD, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. Now it's yeah. it's crazy. You know, for 2018, yeah, BNB just crazy, and yeah. no one talks about it. You know, if you ever make a video on it, no one's interested in talking about it. But for some reason, it's still so high. So um, no, I think. Altcoins definitely have a long way to go. I remember getting ripped apart on YouTube last year when I would talk about taking profits, and I'm a bit, I guess I'm a bit more blunt and, and not as diplomatic in the in the words that I use. Mm. But the just taking profits, and none of these altcoins, I say a lot of them, like, none of the altcoins are chosen ones. I don't, you know, put ETH and beat and 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 BNB aside for this point, mm -hmm. uh, but I don't think. Any of the altcoins are the chosen one that you can just throw money into and walk away, and it's all going to be okay. There's there's going to be a period where they'll probably never come back. A lot of them we know will never come back, and that's just the reality of it. It's not like you could call it our opinion, but right. what I've seen from the people creating these coins and the VCs in them, they don't give a flying f about you know who's in it, what's in it. It doesn't matter. It's for them. It's create something, dish it off move on to the next thing. And, you know, I think if we take that perspective, then I, I wouldn't be throwing my money in it. My money is my time. I've put a lot of time into doing things. I'm just going to throw it at some coin and just hope for the best. So, yeah, I mean, like you said, it, it, things don't have to repeat exactly the same. So maybe they'll bottom a bit longer, maybe they'll bottom slightly earlier. But I definitely see more downside to alt BTC. Uh, the Bitcoin dominance is, I think that'll definitely go up a little more. Um, I think you've got a chart where it's, you know, the dominance without the stable coins right. in it, which would be fantastic if we could find it on TradingView, but it's not there. Um, well, you can always you can always sort of sort of make it by just, uh, you know, you can take out USDC and USDT and, and DAI. I mean, you can take out some of the bigger ones and, and sort of get a proxy for it. But I think the yeah. dominance without stables is around 51% right now. So it's broken through that high of forty nine percent and just yeah, climbed it, it, above, it which is like a good it's breaking, sign. It looks like it's broken out for sure. Yeah, yeah. So I, I would see Bitcoin going up in the dominance, and then in terms of my charts and fifty percent levels in terms of support and resistance, um, my next level up was about I think the the short one was about fifty two, but the major one was around fifty six percent. And then you know we can talk about further up, but we're not there yet. So right, that's I mean, that's journey. what I was seeing. What's that? I just said, I mean, the dominance going up, it, it usually is a long journey because, I mean, in, in 2018, uh, the dominance didn't really stop going up until like mid-2019, <laughs> you know, like it was, uh, it, it went yeah. up it went up during the bear market and then it went up during the mini bull market. <laughs> yeah, everyone just got super excited in 2019 back into that peak in, uh, I think it was June, where we just broke out out of nowhere in April, May, June peaked and then it was like, are we actually going to go to 20K at this point? It just yeah. seemed too early. Yeah. I think it's like everyone then, yeah, by surprise, is... including myself. I'm not, I was like, what's going on here? Like, I'm not expect, <laughs> I was not expecting this. I was, I was sort of expecting a repeat of, of 2015 where we just go sideways. Yeah. At, you know, we went sideways at $200 basically for the entire year. And honestly, I, I thought crypto was just like kind of dead. Like, I didn't even... Like, it that felt was me. so dead. Yeah. So then just January, February, March. Yeah. But so then in 2018, you know, in 2018, I was like, wow, like it's actually going up, like, you know, in, in April, May, June, July, uh, and it started to come back down. But yeah, I mean, like, I, I think all this is, is, is really, it really does provide, you know, some perspective on the market. And, and you're right. I mean, like BNB probably is one of the coins that hasn't gotten enough love on, on crypto YouTube. Uh, it's probably just not as, as flashy as, as some of the other ones or, um, but you're right. I mean, Maybe you know, the like, price is too high. <laughs> Yeah, but I mean, if you think about it, like exchanges, bucks. exchanges make money whether the price is going up or down. You know, uh, so if you're thinking from like a pure business perspective, right? Exchanges, to some degree, they have it figured out, right? I mean, like they're going to make money regardless. Um, yeah, and and so you know, it would make sense that that you you know, BNB has held up a lot a lot better than some of the other altcoins. And another thing you mentioned too is is that 
you know, you don't really want to just throw your money at, at just any random altcoin because you don't know what's going to happen. Like the, the developers could walk away. We've actually seen that from a lot of projects already, right? Like a lot of prominent developers from, from some of the bigger projects decided, you know what, they don't want to do deal with it anymore. And I think a lot of time we saw that in 2018 as well. I th or in 2017, I, I think a lot of times what it is is like they sort of see the writing on the wall and they don't see the vision for it. So they just rather get out and not deal with it anymore. <laughs> Um, yeah, and they don't have anything tying them to the project. Like I think people really believe that altcoins are like investing in uh, stocks in the in the early two thousands or, or late nineties or whatever. And it's like no, they, they're not. You're not holding a share of the company. You're just holding right. something imaginary. And they have they have no, uh, you know, they don't have to stay here if they don't want to. It's just. In a decentralized land, if you stop working, you stop working. It's over. Right. Yeah. You know? I mean, there's nothing. And, and a lot of times back in 2018, it was like after all these ICOs. So the developers uh, had already been paid ahead of time. So then they had less incentive to keep working on it because they'd already been paid uh, through, their, through their ICO. <laughs> um, and, and another thing, too, I mean, uh, another uh, going off that same point, you know, you might be in an altcoin and it might seem primed to rally. And and then the SEC sues you, you know. I mean, that's what happened. To X, that's what happened to XRP. I mean, and I, I know a lot of people that were were XRP bulls and and sort of watched this cycle come and go, and mm. it never really went anywhere. And I mean, arguably XRP is. is I mean, it's um, it certainly has an interesting you know record with social media or you know what people may or may not think about it. But it'd be interesting to know how it would have performed. Had the SEC not, you know, opened that case against them, and and to say, you know, the same thing could happen to other coins this coming, you know, in the next bull market, right? We might be primed for liftoff. Bitcoin goes up, and then maybe you're knee deep in an altcoin that's now faced with a lawsuit. So again, it's just another example of, um, yeah, yeah. And you look at some of those old coins; they only they only kind of just made it back to their old old all time highs. You know, you had Litecoin. Everyone thought that was going to go bananas, and basically dead top. Right. That's all the way back down. You know, the old school stuff like XMR, that really didn't do too much because it all got delisted. It was, you know, right. I guess it's a coin that actually works. Yeah. <laughs> That's why they, they, they don't want it on exchanges. Um, but then the other thing is the, the hopes and dreams are always disguised as something new. You, like we remember the ICO stage and then back then we also had masternodes. You know, everything was about a masternode and you buy all these coins mm. and you stake them somewhere and then you get paid out in that same coin. So it's just a big Ponzi scheme. This time we had DeFi. It's like exactly the same tokenomics, but it was a new term and it sounded really cool. So next time, what are we going to have? You know, we've had Metaverse, we've had NFTs. Do you think these things are going to come back as big as they have been since the hope and the dream is pumped? Do we get new hopes and dreams in the next cycle? So there's always yeah, new, that's, there's that's, always it's new hopes. It's too risky and, for me. Yeah, and there's always there's new always... hopes and dreams. Every, every cycle, there's a new buzzword and there'll be a new buzzword next cycle too. I, I do imagine though that some of the some of the um, hype next cycle will probably be after the transition of Ethereum to proof of stake and after there's no more regulatory risks or whatever. I just think yeah, I look at the market right now and I, I you know, I, I'm concerned with all the regulatory risks coming, especially for the altcoin market. Um, what's that going mm -hmm. to look like over the next six to 12 months? And it, I mean, it just makes me more comfortable to be mostly, you know, more, more focused on, on, on Bitcoin. Um, at least for the time being. And I, I think that's another thing is people have to understand that you might be bearish on something for a certain time period and then you might you might flip bullish on it. It's just the way markets work. But, you know, sort of wrap this up. Um, and, and this is sort of getting a little bit further out there. So we've talked about the bear market. You, I mean, I, I think you, you mentioned early on that you think we'll, we'll see some type of a bottom either later this year, early next year. If, if I'll show you a quick chart on that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is sure. that all right? Sure. All right, I know we want to keep it going. I'll um, I'll share this, <clears throat> and I'll go to this one. So this one's the four-year cycle. I know there was a lot of talk back in 2021 looking at a four-year cycle, and then we had the lengthening cycles, which we won't right. bring up again. And there was a bit of pain there. But <laughs> the four-year, people are thinking it had to happen exactly the same as last time. You know, it's we shoot up to this big peak, and then we dump. Um, and really... If we just look at uh, the whole entire chart of, of Bitcoin, uh, I'll use this little section first. We're just looking at lows to lows. This is sort of why I'm thinking later this year we'll get a low. The four-year cycle is really just about a trend of up and down. We move up three years, down one, years, that one year. That's pretty much it. 
And so we do that time and time again. The peak to peak is a different story. They happen to be about three years. Do we have to get it again? We don't have to, but it's sort of working out within the real estate cycle as well. If we do get this low come in <coughs> late 2022, early 2023, that gives us that next three to so years to get up close to the peak of the real estate cycle, which to me is the big, the big pyramid and all of these other things that we trade are the small stuff. And so, you know, you and I use altcoins to trade to get more Bitcoin and USD. These cycles are really, really quick. The real estate cycle takes much, much longer because it's the whole entire world that's involved. So four years, there's our low coming in sort of probably September, maybe through to January of next year, um, you know, sort of trending down. And then within this four years uh, range, lows to low, we can see all the major lows came in around that peak, uh, th those bottoms about three years, low to high. And then within the four years, there's a range of about 13 months to about 19 months from the, the lows that come within that cycle. And so that's all I'm doing as I project out using the, the entire history of Bitcoin, sort of around each low to a significant low. I use high lows as a, as a very, very significant low. And then the next low, you got another low, and then the major low for the cycle. So you can see 18 bars, these are all monthlies, um, uh, monthly charts, 17, 16, 19, 13, 15. And again, looking at into this cycle, we got 15 and we have 15 again. I'll just do this, you know, right there, you can see 15. So if I take that and go from the bottom to the extension, if September, if we get a little bit of an extension, October, November, December, somewhere in there, it lines up with the one year down, it lines up with the four years. So that's why I'm looking sort of later September, uh, later quarter three or potentially quarter four. Of course, they can extend a little bit more. That's We all know that. So there's a little bit more to it than just sort of throwing numbers out there. It was sort of calculated off the, the previous cycles as well. Right. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think that makes sense to, to think about it in terms of the lows and um, I mean, certainly ever since the bear market started, it seems like, you know, we, we are still need, we still need some pain, even just looking at the altcoin market, it still seems like we need some pain for a while. And hopefully by mm -hmm. the end of the year, uh, you know, the market will look a little, a little bit better. But I, I think we should probably go ahead and, and wrap it up there. I, I appreciate, you know, like the insight you provided yeah. not only on crypto, uh, but also on, on real estate. And, um, and just a reminder, if you're watching this, this video, you can go subscribe. To Jason, I'll, I'll leave his all his uh, information down in the description below, his YouTube, his Twitter, and his Instagram. It's a pleasure to have you on here, and I, I'm sure we'll try to have you on again in the future. Likewise. Thanks, Ben. Thanks, everyone.